Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Today's episode of Hack the Entrepreneur is brought to you by Acuity Scheduling. Acuity Scheduling makes scheduling easy. Clients can view your real-time availability and self-book appointments, fill out forms, and even pay online, eliminating 100% of the drudgery. To learn more and get a 45-day free trial, visit acuityscheduling.com slash hack. That's A-C-U-I-T-Y scheduling.com slash hack. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is a tech-loving entrepreneur based in Amsterdam. He spent four years as the co-founder of GeoRun, a mobile activation software company for the iOS and Android systems. Today, he is the co-founder of Recruity, a SaaS recruiting platform with offices in the Netherlands and Poland. They've spent the past two years taking over the European hiring market and are gearing up to take over North America. Now, let's hack Perry Ostom. Today's episode is brought to you by Acuity Scheduling. When you book appointments or meetings, you know how challenging the back and forth can be to find the right day and the right time? A huge part of running a successful business is having meetings and also networking to reaching out to people and just sitting down for 15 minutes or 20 minutes on a phone call and seeing how you can help each other. The only way to get a yes from people when you do outreach is to have a simple scheduling system set up. What if you could never ask what time works for you again? Acuity Scheduling will make your scheduling easy. It works with your existing Google, Office 365, iCloud, or Outlook calendar. Plus, your clients can view your availability and self-book appointments immediately. It helps you avoid no-shows with automatic text and email reminders. Plus, it's extremely simple to use, and they offer phenomenal customer support. Here's what I want you to do. Visit acuityscheduling.com slash hack. Paid plans start at just $10 a month, but listeners of Hack the Entrepreneur can access a free 45-day trial of Acuity Scheduling stress-free schedule management. That's a month and a half of scheduling bliss, absolutely for free, just by going to acuityscheduling.com slash hack. That's A-C-U-I-T-Y scheduling.com slash hack. back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur. And today we have a very, very special guest. Perry, welcome to the show. Thanks. Welcome. Good to have you. Good to be here. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun, I think. All the way from Poland today. I like this. <laughs> Normally from Amsterdam, but today from Poland it is. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Perry, let's just jump into this. Perry, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? Mm, very good question. We start out with a philosophical question straight away. So the first thing that jumps in mind is uh, persistence. I think uh, there are a lot of upsides, downsides. It sounds like a cliche, but it, it does feel like a roller coaster from time to time when you're popping up champagne to celebrate a new customer or a big deal or partnership one day and the next day you <laughs> you feel down because there are quite some setbacks and there are things you need to overcome. So I think the number one thing is, is definitely being persistent and don't let things fool you and uh, go on with your own vision and your own way. I like that. Persistence. So it's true because there's going to be the upsides and downsides. So is there a way that you, besides just general persistence, but like dealing with Dealing with like the downsides, one thing, but how do you deal with like landing that big partnership maybe and not like just riding on that for mm -hmm. like a couple of weeks or something and just kind of like, oh, well, we can let it hang because it doesn't matter. We've already landed this big deal. How do you keep pushing forward? Hmm, cool. One. Well, I think it, it depends on the team and your ambition. So I've been working remotely for about five years together with my co-founder, Paul Smokestack is actually from, from Poland. That's why we're here. And it 
if you start working out remotely, you need to set clear goals and clear expectations, of course. And, and a lot relates to personal ambition. Like, what do you want to be in five years? What do you think the company or whatever you're working on could be in 10 years? And you need to be on the same page when it comes to those ambitions, because a lot of decisions relate to that and, of, of course, need to match up with your, your, the target you set for your team. So I think it's, it's a lot about team setting and ambitions to push each other forward and remind each other, hey, we're not going to make it. If we keep lagging this deal, we need to say no and go on to the, to the next thing or we need to say goodbye and go on to the next challenge. So I think it's all about what expectations do you set with your whole team together and what do you want to accomplish together? Yeah. And is, is that a crucial sort of part of picking your co-founders as well? Yeah, definitely. When I graduated about uh, six years ago from university, I actually set out to find a a technical co-founder for for a couple of ideas I had. And I remember going to meetups, going to to all kinds of events, even looking online to find my counterparts because my background is is marketing and entrepreneurship. So I wanted to find a technical co-founder to to really be uh, together in this journey. And that was, that was actually uh, quite a struggle to find someone with the same, same type of ambition, same kind of mindset. It's, it's almost like finding, <laughs> finding a wife or that in business. So I took, I took time for that and I actually uh, decided not to say no uh, or not to say yes to the first person that would relate to that. But yes, that's uh, very, very uh, important on our priority list on everyone that joins the team that we hire, that we do business with. They have to yeah, meet the expectations of, of the whole team. Yeah. I love it. And so you're with Recruity now as the co-founder, but this isn't like your first jump into entrepreneurship. So let's go back if we can, Mm -hmm. because there seems to be this time in every entrepreneur's life when they've sort of, they've realized one of two things that either they have this calling to make this huge difference in the world, or as most of my guests, it seems that you just find you just can't work for somebody else anymore. So I'd like to know which side of the fence you see yourself on, Perry. And then if you could take us back to when you sort of discovered this about yourself. Yeah, well, it starts off with my my grandfather. He was an entrepreneur in in the Netherlands in the flower industry. A lot of entrepreneurs are active in the flower industry, uh, importing and exporting to to other countries in Europe, like Germany, also Russia, also other countries uh, around the Netherlands. And my dad was also an entrepreneur. He took over the business and he, he turned it around depending on opportunities at hand. He, he actually set up a bowling alley, set up property development, did, did all kinds of things related to entrepreneurship. So it's, it's definitely something that I saw in, in the kitchen table, talking about entrepreneurship, entrepreneur family, which inspired me to, to actually go study entrepreneurship. I did a master's degree in entrepreneurship in uh, Rotterdam Erasmus University. So I, I would say it's a personal drive to do something entrepreneurial, and I've always been encouraged by family to do so. Ah, so that's the thing. And did did your schooling have anything to do with entrepreneurship then? Mm, well, I set out to, to Erasmus University because there was one particular master's I like, which was entrepreneurship and new business venture. Uh, in order to do so, you had to do three years of bachelor, of course, of international business. And then I spotted an interesting opportunity, which was a master's degree in law. You could just take a couple of courses from the bachelor and then you could go on and get your master's degree in one year. So I decided to do that as well. So I actually have a degree in, in law and in business now. But the, the thing that really inspired me and it was the reason to, to go for the university was the entrepreneurial master. So you could say I, I tried learning entrepreneurship from a book, you could say. <laughs> But it didn't really work, you don't think? Well, I always give, I give the example, you really want to learn how to swim and you have a great theory book in your hand, but you're standing next to a swimming pool. So it, it feels strange. You just want to jump in and see, <laughs> see what it's like to, to float and to swim. But instead, you'll, you'll try learning it from a book. Yeah, exactly. And then you also have to try and trust your professors or teachers that maybe haven't actually jumped into the pool either. Correct. Yeah, correct. I mean, uh, great theories, but uh, real life is a lot different as, uh, as we experienced ourselves. But, uh, but, but still, it's good to, there are a lot of guests, colleges, for instance, are, are given by real entrepreneurs. There are a lot of case studies, a lot of success stories that you try to reverse engineer to find the success factors of, of entrepreneurs. A little bit like the podcast you have, just uh, try to hack entrepreneurship, you could say. <laughs> so I really enjoyed that. It was, it was fun. Maybe not as, as useful in real life entrepreneurship, but I think good to have the theory backed up anyway. Yeah. So is is the law degree now like a backup plan in case this whole entrepreneurship thing doesn't? Oh, no, please. No. 
<laughs> Please, no, no. It was always a, a golden triangle that I, I really like philosophy, learning about how people behave, the origins of, of our behavior and our, our thinking. I also really like law because, because I want to know the, the foundations of what is allowed, what's not allowed, and how, how law is evolving over time. It helps you make rational decisions. And I also really like entrepreneurship. So I always want to do a combination of the three. And I did read a lot of books in my spare time on, on philosophy. So I kind of feel that I, I have the theory of those three areas. Nice. And I guess the, like being fascinated with how humans think and act, I mean, obviously leads you really well into marketing, which is what you said your sort of background is because that's all it is, right? It's psychology and <laughs> trying mm -hmm. to figure out those points. Sure. Yeah. Big chunk. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good use for it. So at the beginning, Perry, you said persistence is your one thing. Now, all the experts in business talk about this 80-20 rule. You're supposed to do 20% of the work, get 80% of the results. You're supposed to do what you're good at and delegate the rest. Can you, Perry, tell me something that you are absolutely not good at in your business? <laughs> Well, I, I have a hard time organizing my work because I, I want to do a lot of things at the same time, try to juggle a lot of the same balls, a lot of balls at the same time, I mean. Um, so I have to quite early on find people around me that help me organize a bit. So I, I try to find people around me that tell me a bit what to do because uh, in order for them to, to excel and proceed, they, they need me to act as well. So. I really like people around me that tell me I need this from you. We need to get this done. So it says clear, clear guidelines. And of course, well, I think finding the right people together is, is something that we, we do among the team nowadays. So I, I wouldn't say it's just me doing that. It's actually that we that I delegated it to others and invite them to join that growth as well. And this is your second business venture, I believe now with Recruity, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So this, idea of like not being good at organizing and so needing to put somebody in charge sort of a view. Did you realize this during your first business or is this something that you sort of realized a bit too late and made sure to implement with Recruity? Yeah, yeah, I guess you could say the latter because the first business, we when we started off about five years ago, we, we wanted to create a scalable software. So we, we set out to create something that could be used worldwide. And the company that we had, Jiorun, was, was making mobile GPS games, like quite local games, which was a lot of fun. But at some point we realized it was turning into an agency model. So we were doing campaigns every every month. And we said at some point to each other, like, okay, this is this is fun. We could go on, but it's going to be an agency where we have a lot of people as account managers, etc., working in, in teams on maybe several campaigns at the same time, which was in all honesty, not the type of business that we wanted to have or that we set out to have from the beginning. So we tried to turn it around into something that fits our, our personal ambitions, um, which we literally done by uh, putting 10 things on paper of what is our ideal scalable business. And we looked at the current business and, and we looked at those 10 criteria of our holy grail of, uh, of, of software business. And we realized that it was only living up to what 20, 30 percent of those criteria. So we had to face that and say, OK, maybe it's time to, to do a side project to see if a side project that has the ideal ingredients of, of scalable business. And that's how Rakuti started, actually, because at some point we realized, okay, we need to experiment with different concepts that do meet the, um, the criteria of scalability. Wow. So, okay. So this is, this is a great place to move into this idea of, so you have sort of the 10 things on paper that, this, that you want for a scalable software business mm. to meet those criteria. Now, now that you have those, I, I would think that those are fairly simple to come up with. Scalability, obviously not, not the agency model, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. You can work distributed teams, but how now do you, or did you and your co-founder start finding business ideas to put through that 10 step process? <laughs> yeah, these, these 10 uh, criteria are, are written in stone. I have it in the, in the office in Amsterdam, actually on the wall, because a lot of things we do is really need to live up to those 10 criteria. Otherwise we don't run the experiment. So how we do that is we literally sit down with the whole team that was working in Jiron. We had five people by then and we just throw ideas on the table. We've been brainstorming, going back and forth with ideas for about a month, which was I think about two years ago now. And we, we did research. So we, we looked at software in the market. We, we thought about, so what problems do, do we encounter ourselves? What is, what is something that we like to work on? 
So we actually be- went back and forth from a new sales CRMs to brand monitoring tools, a trend that we really liked as well, like online monitoring. And then it was actually my co-founder, Paul, who said, I've been making an African tracking system during his studies as a side project that he did for, for another company. And it was quite a successful venture afterwards. It got acquired by a company in Poland. It's, it turned into thousands of, uh, of customers. And my first response was, well, now we're going from this mobile, sexy, funny games to the recruitment software. Like, that's not <laughs> fun at all. <laughs> I wasn't a fan, to be honest, initially. But um, yeah, but we sat down, we looked at the 10 criteria, and it was living up to every single one of them. One of the criteria, which was coming for me, was saying, I want to know how to sell it before we start building it. So I want to have a clear pain point, a clear angle of how to go to market. And I want to build up a client base before we write one single line of code. So I'm already start calling. I'm already setting up landing pages before building it. And I want to have 200 people that say, okay, if it's ready, I'm, I'm actually willing to help testing it and potentially buy it if it's living up to my needs. And this, this could be done with that idea. So the more research we did, yeah, the enthusiastic, more enthusiastic the whole team became. And, and we said, okay, that, let's do it. Let's run an MVP of two, three months. Let's build it, test it, and uh, see where it ends. Wow, I love it. I love this idea. Of... Big, big pivot, really big pivot. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. But I mean, it's obviously working out for you. And I want to know how to sell it before we build it. Hmm. So you said you wanted to sell like 200 first? Like how many did you sell before you decided that, okay, that's cool. Check it off. Um, well... Just a side note, it wasn't selling. It was more that we wanted to have a beta list of committed uh, testers before actually uh, okay. releasing it out of the blue. So what I did is I went to vacancy sites, like uh, sites, uh, job boards, and, and all kind of networks where people were posting jobs. And I just made a list of, I think we, we, we put down together a list of thousands of companies that were actually having jobs. And I started calling them. I simply started calling until we had 200 people saying, okay, sounds interesting what you guys are going to do. I'll help out testing. I'll give you honest feedback. So I spent over, well, I think I have records of that. I think over 200 hours of calling, hearing no all the time, of course, but eventually having 200 people saying, okay, I'll help out testing. Wow. So not paid people, just beta testers. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to give you... What feedback were you looking for? That it was a valuable service or how to make it better? Yeah, both, of course. First of all, we, we had no pricing um, uh, strategy at that point. So we wanted to know what, what value can we offer? How can we be different? And what are people willing to pay for this? So we, we told them quite openly, it's going to be a SaaS fee. We don't know what it's going to cost yet, but we want to set that together with you. So <laughs> quite openly, actually. I remember going to an agency that was working in Excel. They, it, it's a recruitment agency, still a client of ours, actually, two, two years later. But they were working in Excel. So they had four or five clients, 10 jobs per client. So they had about 50 open jobs managed in Excel. So imagine 50 jobs, about 50 candidates per job, different stages, interviews planned, ratings going on, all in Excel. And I went there because they were about two hours drive away. And I told them, okay, please use our software, please, because it's really going to benefit you. And if you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it. But in return, I want you to tell me what you'll be willing to pay for it uh, in all honesty. So tell me what is really solving for you, what, what, what issues it's solving for you and how you benefit. And tell me a fair price then. Nice. Did you, did you offer to import their data for them at first? To get them going? Um, no, actually. No, they, they were kind of hesitant to switch from the old way of working to a totally new system. So we decided to start off with one job and just gradually go on and build up new data in there. So we actually didn't transfer or something. We just started from scratch. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because I know some people, they, get, like, like you, they have that giant spreadsheet, like you said. And it's like, well, it would take so much for me to switch, transfer this over that it's too big of a hurdle for me. <laughs> Yeah, anything can be solved. I mean, uh, solved. I mean, it's 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 a matter of you can import data, you can help people set up in the worst case manually. So for all the problems are are solutions in the end. There we go. That's the answer. That's the answer. So, Persistent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now with smaller projects like within Recruity at this point, do you when you determine when you're determining whether a project like a new feature set or a new marketing campaign or something. When you're determining whether it's worth yours and your team's time, energy, and resources, 
do you just go through the same 10 step process? Mm, I think in a, in a, in a smaller perspective, yes, because these, these were real company settings. So you could, this was really on, on a general vision, general level, but in, in a small way, yes. Like we always run little experiments on, on ideas that are brought forward, uh, bottoms up. So everyone in the team is able to bring forward ideas. We cherry pick together like a kind of voting on what experience we're going to run. Could be in design, could be in sales, could be in a lot of different places of the company. And we give it a certain scoring on the effort involved and a potential return. And then with the highest scoring, we simply pick the, uh, pick the efforts to do first. And we give it a decent amount of effort and we look at the results. If it works, we put more resources in it. If it doesn't work, we go on to the next experiment. So it's more like a kind of scoring system on what the required effort is and what the potential outcome is of, of an idea. I like it. And when you say it either, like when it works, you keep putting resources to it, or when it doesn't, you don't, you just kind of cast it aside. But how, like, how much do you guys involve like iteration on an idea? So it's like, I still think this is a good idea, but it's just not working yet. So let's iterate, 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 iterate until we hit it. Mm -hmm. Or do you iterate and then, okay, no, let's just move on to the next one. Difficult, difficult one, because of course, if you have, have a strong feeling that something would work, you want to be persistent, but I would say it's all about the data. You just, every single idea that you bring forward needs to be tested and the proof is not in the pudding, but in the data action. So if you run a kind of landing page, if you run even experiment with a new CRM tool or, or a new, we recently implemented a new customer support tool, like a new chat tool. It just simply shows that, yes, we have a quick response rate to customer tickets coming in. So the data tells it, basically. So if, if everyone is data-driven and tries to show the effect in terms of what, what's being gained, then, then it's fine. Yeah, you have the data to back it up. I like it. I like it. It's The proof isn't in the pudding. It's in the data. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your team, if we can. You are from Amsterdam, and you are currently in Poland with your team. So... How's the team spread out? Is it between just those two cities or is it fully distributed? Yeah, three cities actually. One person is in Philadelphia now setting up the team over there. Beth, we have, my co-founder and I have been working all the way from, from GeoRun founding five years ago uh, remotely. So we decided to set up the technology team, the development team in Poznan, which is a, a quite a vibrant city. It's two hours driving from Berlin. A lot of tech universities, so we can scale up quite quite quickly here. A lot of good tech people around, a lot of young guys eager to learn new languages. So we saw so many benefits of, of having our team in Poland that we decided just to keep it there. So he's still growing up in Poznan and, and will stay here with the team. Now with seven other people, in a year time, we grew to, to eight. And I always stayed in, in Amsterdam to, to make sure that the sales, the marketing and the support is there. And we have our, our client base mainly in Europe and more and more often in, in the US. So that's where we have a presence as well now. So it's, it's actually Poland development, Amsterdam marketing, and then some, some more support in the US. Oh, I like it. So was it conscious on your part to, to sort of tackle Europe first? Mm, yes, it was because we saw when we did market research, we saw a lot of big, scary competitors in the U.S. That was the first uh, <laughs> first reason to try out in the, in the Netherlands. But mainly because of our network. We've been part of the Rockstar Accelerator Network. Not because we're in the program of an accelerator, but we, we always wanted to stay close and have our office there. So from the first day that we opened an office five years ago, we, we did it inside the Rockstar Accelerator building, instantly getting exposure to 50 startups. And we stayed within that network. So we had a, a great network of, let's say, 80, 90 fast-growing tech startups, some which, which grew to 30, 40 people by now, all still under the same roof in Amsterdam. So it was a great scene for us to, yeah, to, to gain a valuable network, but also to benefit from a lot of brainstorming sessions and, in general, good, good atmosphere going on. I like it. So now you've built up the network, you've built up customer base, you've built out your product so it's solid, and now you're ready to come over to Philadelphia and start tackling. <laughs> yes, we have big plans. And uh, I noticed that maybe it's because of my theoretical background, but we have a kind of different style of management where we, we do have a vision, we do have a certain ambition and goal setting, sure, but we don't typically work towards one goal. So traditionally, whole life is set up in a way that you specialize and you go on with a career, you try to, to accomplish a certain goal in life. 
but we try to do it the other way around. It's actually a theory which is called effectuation theory. It's a kind of entrepreneurship where you look, uh, instead of a funnel view where you're going, you try to put your funnel upside down and think, what resources do we have? What chances are out there in the market? And what possible roads could we take with this team and these opportunities at hand? So we, although we, we have a certain vision what this company should become and what, what we can do best, we also want to stay flexible and open for all the opportunities in a year from now we don't foresee now yet. So it requires a lot of flexibility in order to take side steps in your, in your route that might become the main route, actually. I like it. I like it. Effectuation theory? Effectuation theory. Yeah, I wrote my thesis on that, and it uh, <laughs> wow. it opened my eyes on on a leadership and and how to build a company and how to find people that would stay open for innovation and and realize that the sidestep that you do and the experiment that you run might potentially shift the whole direction in 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 a few months' time. I love it. I'm going to find an article or two yeah. on effectuation theory, and I will link to it in the show notes for you and your. I will, uh, I will send you my thesis. No worries. Oh, there we go. We'll link to that and everybody can take a read at that and learn. So that's your sort of forward moving of the business. So this is a great place to sort of wrap up with you. And this idea I'm working with calling the entrepreneurial gap. So this is your second business, Perry, and you have goals ahead of you personally and within business. And so in one month, when you hit that revenue metric in six months, when you take over America, all those things are the goals you're going to set and you have to set, but we both know that right before you hit those goals, you're going to set bigger, loftier ones into the future. Mm. And so sometimes as entrepreneurs, we end up living in this gap where no matter what we accomplish, we never personally feel successful, yet from the outside, we look super successful. So I would like to ignore everything in front of you right now, although I know you're going huge places, but if you could stop, Perry, look behind you, and tell me how you feel about the highs, the lows, the wins and the losses up until today. Well, that's absolutely right. You, I noticed that as well. You're going so fast and it feels like you're in a train and you're not moving. Well, the outside world might think you're actually going quite fast. But, but you're right. It does feel like things are going slow and you, you, you don't go fast enough. And, but it's, it's, it's very good to take a step back. And an example is a trip to Poland, where we take the whole team of the Netherlands and we take them to a trip to Poland. It's, it's of course serious because we're working here the whole week, but it's also a lot of fun. And we try to take a step back from work and just enjoy time together, talk about what we accomplished, talk about all the things that, all the ideas that individual members have, put them on a whiteboard and also also sit down and celebrate the little successes. And uh, I think it's important to, yeah, to, to take a pause once in a while and <laughs> realize what you've accomplished so far. Are you happy with it? Yeah, very happy, yeah. Nice, I like it, I like it. All right, Perry, we've got to talk about Recruity sort of in passing, but could you specifically tell the listener about Recruity right now and then where to track it down online? Sure, so Recruity started off because of our own uh, issues that we had with, with hiring people. We noticed there's a quite need, a quite a need in, uh, in organizing the process. So we set out to, to build a traditional applicant tracking system as the technical term is. It's a place to store all your applicants, all your jobs, and more, more importantly, all your communication around that recruitment process. Quite early on, we realized that we had to add more value. There were more needs that a particular recruiter has. So we also started to integrate with job boards. We build an employer branding a website builder. We have sourcing tools to help you find candidates online. And so it kind of became a recruitment platform, you could say, where all the way from making a job description to actual hiring, you organize that whole process. And we still develop and we still adjust things based on how we think modern companies should be organized. Which, which relates a lot to our own hiring and our own remote structure, which, which is you do it together. So we really believe in a vision of great teams are built together and you should make everyone in your company part of that process, part of that growth. I love it. I love it. And that's recruity.com. So R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-E.com. Is there anywhere that people can track you down on social media, Perry? Yeah, Perry Ostom on Twitter, Recruity on Twitter as well, of course. And um, I'm on LinkedIn as well, of course, Perry Ostom. Excellent. So Perry Ostom on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Recruity.com, as well as his thesis on effectuation theory. Those will all be in the show notes on hacktheentrepreneur.com for you when you're done traveling, walking, working, whatever it is you're doing right now. 
So once again, Perry, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Thanks for stopping by. I really, truly appreciate it. And please just keep doing what you're doing because it's awesome and inspiring to watch. My pleasure, John. You all also keep doing what you do. It's great. Love it. Thanks. Perry, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for sharing. I know you were busy over there in Poland, visiting your team, and working with them. Uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to stop by. I hope you out there listening enjoyed that conversation as much as I enjoyed it participating in it. And I want you to know that since this conversation has happened, Perry has reached out and sent me a great, great, great article. It's a PDF, I believe, on effectuation theory for entrepreneurs. So I will link to that in the show notes at hacktheentrepreneur.com for you. And I, 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 I totally recommend it as a great read. It's completely free, but it's an extension of our brief conversation on it today. So besides the effectuation theory, I had to go back. I had to find something that stood out to me in the conversation. There was many things, so it took me a couple tries. I went back, then I went back again, then I went back again, and then I went back one more time. That final time that I went through, there was something that Perry had said to me that I guess I missed it those first couple times, but then there was, it just stood out to me so clearly this final time through. It was that one thing that Perry said. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. You really want to learn how to swim and you have a great theory book in your hand, but you're standing next to a swimming pool. So it, it feels strange. You just want to jump in and see, <laughs> see what it's like to, to float and to swim. But instead, you, you try learning it from a book. And that's the hack. Perry, Perry, Perry. This one is good. This one is good. And this one, this one really hits a nerve with me. So uh, just to say it, if you haven't read my book, the introduction to this book, to the book I wrote, is about the story of when I was a kid and being pushed into a pool and not knowing how to swim. And it's, it's such a great analogy to entrepreneurship because we feel like before, like when we're standing on the edge of that pool, no matter how much knowledge, no matter how much information, no matter how much we've learned, quote unquote, about entrepreneurship, until we've jumped in that pool, there's no way to really figure it out, right? And it's, it's not like when you're learning how to swim that when you first get into a pool, nobody expects you to swim laps that day, right? And so I don't know why with business, we figure that if we're going to start a business, we have to know everything about starting a business before we're willing to sort of wade into the water and learn how to maybe just keep our head above water at first, maybe sink even a bit and get saved by someone else. You can take this analogy really far and it really, really, really should help you get your like, mindset around the idea of entrepreneurship. Nobody knows how to swim at the beginning. Nobody knows how to start a business before they've started a business and just learn to sort of tread water. That's why from whatever skill you might have, freelancing for other people or consulting for other people around that skill set, it's not maybe quote unquote entrepreneurship. Some people argue it's not, but it teaches you how to tread water, i.e. make money without having a direct paycheck coming from a boss. It teaches you so much about yourself, about how business works in that sense, and then you can sort of productize it and create something scalable after. But you don't have to know this stuff jumping in, quote unquote. It's really about sort of being willing to take that risk. There's a curse of knowing or trying to learn too many things before you even know what the proper questions are to ask. So I love this analogy, Perry. I really, really, truly do. This is, this is standing on the side of the pool with an excellent theory book on learning to swim, but being scared to jump in. It's time. Just jump into the pool. Learn how to just sort of keep your head above water at first. Eventually, you will start to swim laps. Perry. Thank you so very, very, very much. All right, that was, that was fun. That was fun. That, that, that really ties in nicely and really, I think that's why Perry and I, we really kind of hit it off during our conversation because I think because we see sort of eye to eye on those things. And Recruity is doing really, really well for Perry and his team now, but I mean, this isn't his first venture. This isn't how, he didn't just jump in and start doing this, right? There's been other ones where he sank and just had to let them go. 
And that's cool. That's how the process works. So Perry, thank you so much for stopping by. Hacktheentrepreneur.com. Check out Perry, the links, and I'll find the link to that article on effectuation theory for you uh, because I think it's worth learning. I think it's worth taking with you into the pool, if you will. (laughs) All right. If you get a chance and you're digging the show, just stop by um, Apple, iTunes. That's the word. If you stop by iTunes, if you're on an iPhone, there's a magical link that I've created, hacktheentrepreneur.com slash review. And it will take you straight to the page where you can leave a rating and a review, and it would help the show so very, very much. And I'll thank you in advance. Hacktheentrepreneur.com slash review. Or just go straight to wherever it is you get your podcast from right now, probably iTunes, and leave a rating and a review for Hack the Entrepreneur. And it would make me so happy. It would make me just a happy Canadian. You know, that's what you want, right? (laughs) All right, it's been fun. Thank you so much for stopping by. I truly do appreciate it. And please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur. (laughs) 